fall, some of you know Kanye West dropped this album called Jesus is King. And that song, that was it. That was the song, Jesus is Lord, um, is just kind of the central expression of the whole song. And he, he, come, he comes to Christ, and he produces this album, writes all the lyrics, all this kind of stuff. It's a great, great album. And the whole thing is Jesus is Lord of my life, and let me just express that to everybody. Someone noted that um, just one song, has he, he mentions Jesus more than some preachers do, like in a whole month. And, and everybody's like wondering what's up with Kanye. I remember when he came out with the album. I think it was the day before the album came out. He's on Jimmy Kimmel's show. And Jimmy asked him, he said, uh, so now are you, are you like a Christian artist? You know, it's kind of like, are you, where are you going here? And Kanye answered real quickly. He's, he's, he's like, I'm, man, I'm Christian to everything is what he said. Like how would I, if Christ is Lord of my life is what he's saying. Wouldn't he like permeate everything that I do? How could I be something other than a Christian something in my entire life? And and so, you know, what I want to talk about today as we're continuing this series called This Jesus, we're going to talk about Jesus. Maybe you picked up on this. Jesus, this Jesus who is Lord. Now, we landed the the message last week, if you were here, uh, Travis, myself, we talked about Jesus as Lord. We talked a lot about that because uh, it, it's the central message of the early church. And we've been walking through the book of Acts and seeing this phrase that's used over and over again. This Jesus is used over and over again. And, and we're, we're drawing from, from the scriptures, looking at who Jesus really is, because it's this Jesus and not another Jesus, some fabrication of our own making because what happens in our Christian lives, all of us, I'm prone to do this, is to start pursuing a Jesus that we don't find in Scripture. And so we've said, man, if we're going to fix our eyes on Jesus, and that's the theme for our whole year, then we better get it right. Which Jesus are we talking about here? Is he Lord or is he something else? And so today we're going to be uh, delving, diving quicker, f- further into this. And so I want you to grab your Bible and turn to the book of Acts. And if you're A guest, we hope you just jump in as you already have. You may not know the songs today, but we're so glad that you're here. And if you you are a guest today, maybe a first time guest, maybe you've been here for a while, you've come at a great time because today we're really centering in on what we're about all the time, but we're going to really talk about how do we fix our eyes on Jesus as we move into this year ahead. Uh, We're we're entering into the Easter season, not too far off, if you can believe it. And we're going to be talking about practicing the way of Jesus because central to our faith is is actually a person. And the problem, the discontinuity between the Jesus that confronts us in the Gospels and the one that we tend to worship or maybe who we as Christians start to to swerve off, you know, that we're no longer like him, we don't live like him, that disconnect is the problem in the American church today. And we've determined, man, if we're going to follow after Jesus, then, man, I'm I'm, I'm Jesus everything. I don't have these compartments in my life. Instead, he's central to everything because we're seeing now, and from a pastor who follows this kind of stuff, we're seeing a spiritual, theological, even existential crisis in the American church. And people are not drawn to this Jesus because they're having a hard time finding him. Now, they would, know to, they would know to say that, but this Jesus draws people to himself. This Jesus is the one who changes lives. And so we've said, man, let's focus on him. Let's fixate on Jesus, this Jesus. And as we do, he's going to change our hearts. That's why I have great hope, is that when we get our hearts set on him, then he changes us. Because, you see, it's possible for us to adopt a Christian kind of system of thinking. Uh, a, a, a kind of a, 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 a worldview, okay, we talk about that, Christian worldview, which is a good thing, saying that you know, my, my Christianity, my relationship with Jesus, it impacts, it, it permeates all of life. It's a comprehensive approach to life. But it's possible to say, I've got this particular system of thinking, I've got a worldview, I have theology, watch this, and not follow Jesus. And so we have Christianity minus Christ that is something else. We're following after a person. It's not some idea. 
And so when we look hard at our own ways of discipleship, how we grow to become like Jesus, it's possible for us, we're going to talk a lot about this in the days to come, it's possible for us to remove Jesus as the rabbi that we're following. And just give me a lot more content. I'm going to give me more Bible. Give me more history. Give me more of that. Now I've got a lot of knowledge. Knowledge does not equal intimacy with Jesus. Now we've got to have knowledge about him. But I want to challenge our thinking here. Ben Myers wrote a book on the uh, Apostles' Creed. And in it, he says this. You can see it there. The heart of Christianity is not an idea, but a brute fact. Okay, that, that's another way of saying a physical force. It, it's not a theory, but a particular human life. Not a general principle, but a person with a name who suffered under Pontius Pilate. Jesus himself is at the center. The continuous reading, he adds, this is interesting, of the four Gospels where we see Jesus, right? See his personality, his person, his patterns of his life, his way, how he lived, is the central spiritual discipline of the Christian life. And so I'm going to challenge you with this question as we walk through this, this sermon today. Is Jesus the defining center of your life? I'm guessing that you're here, most of us, because you're like, That's, I want that to be true. That's an inspiring thought and general idea that I have. That's why I'm here today. I want Jesus to be the defining center. I want everything in my life to recalibrate back to him. That's what it means for him to be Lord, to define who I am. And yet we, we all see it. We've talked about how this happens. Groups, movements, people co-opt this Jesus for their own purposes. You have leaders or even politicians who may not even know him co-opt this that Jesus for their own political right favor or, or, or gain favor within their own constituencies. We we see this this Jesus this Jesus is nobody's boy. He's nobody's pawn. It's why they couldn't nail him even when he he was he was alive. They couldn't place him in certain groups. He, he just confounded everybody because he he is who he is. He's Lord of all. And today we're going to see this anew. My great hope is that as you leave, you're going to be really challenged to say, man, I want Jesus to be Lord of my life. This Jesus we see several times throughout Scripture, and we see it three times in this sermon that we looked at last week, the first sermon that launched the church. It's the sermon that Peter preached in the book of Acts. And if you have your Bible, and I hope you do, turn to Acts 2, uh, verse 36 through 30, uh, 47 is where we're going to be today. And we're going to land this sermon that we looked at last week. If you weren't here, we're going to catch you up a bit. That's okay. Um, Acts is a, a sequel uh, to the first book. It's a two-volume set by Dr. Luke who wrote uh, the book of Acts. And here we're going to see King Jesus. We're going to talk about King Jesus. What I want you to see is Jesus is king. Uh, this king has a kingdom, and the kingdom has a people. And so my challenge will be let's be kingdom people. And we're going to look at what that really looks like. We're going to kingdom people do certain things. They have certain patterns in their lives. And it's going to be a day where you're going to be able to measure the text and scripture up against, man, I mean, I guess we always do this. Am I really living as a kingdom person? Because there's certain patterns that we'll uh, follow and see in the life of those who are kingdom people. So let's get our minds around this King Jesus. Um, we don't know a lot about kings here in in the U.S., so we're kind of fascinated by, uh, by our friends across the pond. Um, and, you know, certain eras of, of history, certainly in England, uh, in the U.K., are marked by certain monarchs. Think about that. Like, you go back to the Elizabethan period uh, or the Victorian period, and, and they have, I mean, it's fashion, it's architecture, it's culture. Everything is, is under the kind of the reign and rule of the monarch, and, and the monarch defines everything about the culture. This is a great kind of analogy for us. Everything, Jesus, our king, permeates all of life. Everything that we do, and we see that uh, even in, in the history in, in the UK and other places where we think of the Ming dynasty or things like that. Man, could it be that God has now ushered in this kingdom through Jesus? He comes and he says, man, the kingdom of God is among you. And now come be my people living in the kingdom. Bring heaven to earth in the way that you live. Bring my will so that he, he permeates every aspect of our lives. 
And so to place this in context, Acts 2, and we're just going to land the last part of the sermon and then see the results of it, what happened. Uh, Peter's been preaching. Amazing things are happening. The Spirit has come in fulfillment of prophecy in Joel and, and places like Isaiah, and he draws from the Psalms. These are people who would know the Scriptures better than us. And he says, this Jesus is the Messiah. He's the long-awaited Messiah. And then the Spirit comes. There's these signs and wonders that Christ has done. And then the Spirit comes. And then he summarizes his message in verse 36. Look at what he says. He says, let all the house of Israel, therefore, okay, because of all that we have said, I've shown that he has proven he's the Messiah. He even proves he's the Messiah before the resurrection, before he gets to that, before he gets to, to all that Christ had done post crucifixion and resurrection, which we know is central to our faith. But Peter says, hey, he's the Messiah. Even before you get to the cross, you, you can prove that he is. And then it says, let all the house of Israel. And so I guess today, let everyone here at Park City's Baptist Church, let everybody know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ. That's interesting. Lord and Christ, Master and Messiah, King and and Savior, this Jesus, whom you crucified. So for him to be Lord, we said last week, means that he's not relegated to uh, kind of my personal intern. You know, the one I call out for favors. He's not my spiritual concierge. Um, he, he is Lord of all. And, and, and it's not that, like I'm going to make him Lord. He is Lord. I'm either going to come under his reign and rule or I'm not. And what I do doesn't change where he is and who he is. And I've noted that in the book of Acts, which is, think about this, the, the, the first preaching of the church, the, the central message, when they referred to Jesus, 99 times they called him Lord in the book of Acts. They called him Savior twice. Now, he's Savior, but because he's Savior, I think that's what's implied, he's Lord. Of all, and we talked about it last week, he is in that place of authority and power. He's king. And and so Peter, now, Jesus is king is the first thing that he says. Jesus is king, and then he says he's proven his claim. Look at what he says. No, for certain, there in verse 36, he says he he is, he's already taken his position, his place. And I noted this is a second volume of two, two books by Luke. And, and he's gone to great, great lengths. If you read Luke first, the gospel, and then Acts, you, you see that in Luke 1, he says that Joseph, even, even his earthly father, is from the house and lineage of David. So even that works out biologically. He's going to prove that Jesus is, is the Messiah, both biologically and then ontologically, from God. That is, out of his being. He says he matches it all up. This is what Peter's been saying throughout his message. Luke 1 he, he, he does that. Luke 2, we know that's the story of Bethlehem. He's born in the city of David. He's, he's fulfilling the prophecy of the Davidic line, right? Luke 3, Jesus is baptized, and right after that, there's the genealogy that takes him back to David and then all the way to Adam. And then in Luke 4, Satan challenges Jesus with the temptation. And he says, if you are the Son of God, Satan knows who he is. In fact, Paul tells us that the demons know exactly who he is, and they, and they shudder. At least they shudder. I mean, some of us just write him off, people in our, in our day, right? He, oh, he's, he's a good man. But no, no, no. He's Lord, and, and, and he proves that he's Lord by overcoming temptation. If we could go through, again, the book of Luke that sets up Acts, he, he, he says the blind man says, Jesus, son of David, he calls him. He knows he's, he's in that lineage. Peter it confesses him as Christ in the book of Luke. And now this continues on in his message. And the exclamation point is the crucifixion and resurrection. So look at this. He has proven his claim, this king. But not only that, he has claimed his title. He's both Lord and Christ, Master, Messiah. The king must assume his position. Okay? He's got to assume the throne. And throughout history, that's not always happened. Think about it. Even in England, maybe if you know some some history there in in the UK and and, and, and monarchies, you have uh, Edward VIII who did not assume the throne. Well, I say that. He did for 326 days. But then he wanted to marry Wallace Simpson. You know the story? Uh, An American divorcee, and in so doing, he had to abdicate the throne. And so he stepped, he wouldn't assume the throne. 
And so this week I was curious. I started reading this week of Valentine's week. And I read of 12 royals, not just in England, who, who abdicated the throne. They were, they were set to get on the throne, lead the nation, and they, they wanted to, they fell in love with a commoner. And they abdicated the throne. They said, not me. So this doesn't just happen in like Disney princesses or princes. Um, this actually happens in real life. And Edward VIII, he abdicates the throne. You could even say even former Prince Harry. And Megan, I mean, you could, you could say, what is he, sixth in line? So he's like, I ain't, I'm out anyway, so I'm out. <laughs> um, but you could argue that they're like, no, we don't want to live as royals anymore. We don't want to live, you know, subjugated to the life and lineage of the royalty. We out. And so what, what happens often is people don't, don't take that position. My point is Jesus and Peter saying he did not abdicate the throne. He has stepped into that place. He's born of the Father. He says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I and the Father are one. I am the truth. I'm the way, the life. I am the Son of God. He was very clear. He did not abdicate his throne. He is Lord. Peter's gone to great lengths proclaiming that he is Lord. And, and if he's Lord, friends, listen, we cannot relegate him to something other than Lord. I love C.S. Lewis's famous quote out of Mere Christianity. Maybe you've heard this before. Listen to this. I'm, I'm trying here to prevent anyone. This is what I'm trying to do. C.S. Lewis, Lewis does it better. I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I do not accept his claim to be God. Lewis says, that is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level of a man who says he's a poached egg, out of context reference, but it still works, or else he would be the devil himself. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit on him. You can kill him as a demon or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great moral or human teacher. He's not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Mic drop. I mean, it's like, wow. And friends, this is the point I'm trying to make to this point. Jesus has proven he's Lord. He's claimed the throne. And then watch this. We have rebelled against him. This is how Peter's landing this sermon. This Jesus whom you crucified. And again, history is replete with monarchs, you know, that are overthrown. Or I think of Oliver Cromwell in the, in, the, in the English history. You've got people who are trying to take the throne and come and usurp the king. And we do it all the time. We continue to do it. And even before people claim him as Lord or receive him by faith, we claim the title, we take it away, and we follow after false kings. And it happens over and over again. We've rebelled against him. And even worse, he says, you crucified him. We, we talked about this last week. Man, you, we've done this. You've done this. I have done this. He went to the cross because of me, my sin. Not people that we would claim were enemies and hostile against him so much. People that we hang out with, my best friends, people who you know are in our families. We know that the person you're going to look back at in the mirror in the morning, that one, me, I killed Jesus. And so this just, I mean, just hit the people hard. We said last week, John Stott has this great quote. Before we can begin to see the cross as something done for us, we have to see it as something done by us. And that should stop us in our tracks, and it does. In fact, look at what it says. Verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And this is the language. Is, How do we fix this? We're in a mess. In the language, how do we fix this problem? Has the king turned his back on us? I mean, if we have usurped his authority, if we've started this rebellion, we've even taken the king off his throne and placed him, we killed him. What do we do? 
And then Peter brings the great challenge, and it's great news for us. I mean, think about it, gang. If you're listening to this message for the first time, it's like, holy smoke, king is dead, killed, wait. But you're saying he's rose again, but what? What do we do now? Because most kings, they come and they will suppress. They will end the rebellion. They'll come back and just defeat everybody. And if he's Lord, surely he could do that. I mean, again, you think of how about Queen Mary, right? And Bloody Mary, who's, who's anybody coming up in Protestants like us. Anybody coming up against the, the throne is going to be taken out. What did Jesus do? Instead, he dies on the cross for those who rebelled against him, us. And he calls us into his kingdom. So look at this. This Jesus is king, and this king has a kingdom. So look at what it says. He's, he's call, he calls us in, and, and he's going to rule over his people. Look at verse 38. And Peter said to them, here's the response. Repent and be baptized. Every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. Now watch this. This is for someone in here today. If you've never received Christ, you're like, I came with friends. I came with family. I just happened upon here. I've gone to church. But listen, if you've never received Christ as your king, as your Lord of life, and say, I'm done with running my own life. Jesus died on the cross for your sin, and he's calling you. you've rebelled against him. He says, but come, come to me still. And look at what he's going to do. He says, you turn, repent, 180, come and be baptized. Be baptized. What is that? It's it's entering into this, we'll talk more about this, entering into this kingdom. It's marking you as a believer, proclaiming him to be Lord. That's what baptism is. He's Lord of my life. Let me show you what's happened in my life. I have died to myself. I'm not running the show anymore. I'm totally forgiven by him. I'm raised up now to walk in a new life, totally forgiven. And I, he is Lord of my life. We even say it out loud. What's your profession of faith? Jesus is Lord. And friends, that's not just a theological claim. That's not a theological statement. It is a theological statement. It's more than that. It's a rallying cry. It says, man, I'm not in charge of my life anymore. This is why baptism is such a big deal. And if you're a believer and you've not been baptized by immersion, I challenge you today to be baptized. Uh, yeah, I'll get around to it. Get around to it. If he's Lord of your life, proclaim him as Lord. Let everybody see and rejoice with you. It's one more life that's been transformed. This is it's not a small deal. It's a big deal. Look at what it says here. Repent and be baptized. And then he says in verse 39, for the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. This is, this is amazing. Not only does he invite us into his kingdom, now he gives us the gift of his Holy Spirit. This king that we've rebelled against invites us in and he gives us gifts. And he says, look at this. This promise is the Holy Spirit that they just saw. They just saw fall upon the people, fulfilling Joel's prophecy in, in, uh, in chapter 2, verse 17 through 21. You can see it there, where the Spirit poured out on all people. He says, all flesh. This is radical stuff. Now the kingdom is open to everyone, not just God's people, not just the Jewish people. The Messiah has come through the Jews, and he, now he opens the gates for everybody to come in. The Spirit is the new covenant fulfillment of the old covenant promises. Look at verse 40. And with many words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. Now, it says with many words. So he kept on preaching. Okay. I got about 15 minutes. So I'll be done. But he kept on preaching. And, 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 and it says here that with many words, he's saying, save yourself. Now, here's the language here. Not just... Well, it's passive, for one thing. It's middle voice. So, so he's saying um, not, it's not something you do. It's something done for you. Let God rescue you so that you can have this salvation. But it's not simply salvation. The language is save yourself from the, the hooks, the talons that have got a hold of you that are this culture that you live in. I mean, think about that today. I'm saying to you, listen. 
Save yourselves from this secular, meaning non-spiritual, earthly only kingdom that we now live in on this earth. See, at some point as a believer, we've got to separate ourselves from the culture that we live in. We should be a peculiar and unique people. People at work ought to think you're weird, frankly, because you belong to another kingdom. He's saying, save yourself from this, this generation, this, this, it, it's this, it, it's the society, the culture we live in. It's the air we breathe. It's the water we swim in. He says, you've got to pull yourself out of that, okay, which is why our gatherings are so important. It's why we come before him in prayer before we start our days. It's why we're in the word, because we don't live in this world. We're aliens in this world. And people at work are going to think you're crazy. Your neighbors are wondering why you get up and go to church every Sunday. This is crazy stuff. Listen, let them think we're crazy about what we believe. But may they never think we're crazy because of the way we live. Instead, let our love win them over, right? I mean, they can question our beliefs. But may they never question our love. That's what draws people to Jesus. That's who he is, this Jesus. And and friends, every one of us, we need to be distinct and unique in our lives. We shouldn't be looking like everybody else. This Jesus, he's real. Uh, You crucified him. He was raised again. This king, Jesus, has a people. And that's that's the message. Uh, He was real. Uh, You killed him. I killed him. God raised him up. He's Lord. That's you want to know what you share. That's what we share with people. And look at what it says in verse 41. So those who received his word were baptized. And there were added that day about 3,000 souls. So the reality, this Jesus is Lord, is the primary confession of our faith. Now, what I want to do the rest of our time is look to see what happened then. We're going to see this famous snapshot of the church. And now we're going to be able to measure our lives up against, you know, what do we do now that he's, he's, uh, he's king? And uh, let me just say this again, the word about baptism, this idea that Jesus is Lord, this proclamation that he's king, that he's Lord, that flew in the face of, of Roman occupied Palestine and all that entire region of the world because Caesar was Lord. And to proclaim that Jesus is Lord of my life through baptism, that could get you killed. That's why this is not a simple theological statement. This was a rallying cry. That I will, I'm giving my life to him. And that's what we do in our day. This still can be the case in some places in the world today. Where people are killed every single day because of their faith. So this king, Jesus, is king. The king has a kingdom. And the kingdom has a people. Okay, let's look at this. Distinguishing marks. I want you to see you can measure your life up. And I hope this, frankly, is is convicting, challenging as it has been for me. Kingdom people are devoted to the kingdom. All right. This is what we see now in verses 42 through 47. Look at verse 42. And they devoted themselves. This is this word means um, passionately devoted. The word is proskartereo in the Greek. It means passionately committed to significantly, exceptionally devoted to to these things, right? To the apostles' teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread, and the prayers. Now, I affirm you for being here today. I'm preaching kind of to the proverbial choir, but let me ask you, are you here every week? Well, if nothing else comes up, I am. Listen, our gathering, the getting together, should be the number one priority of your life. And every Sunday morning, it should be the first priority. And nothing else should get in the way of it. And you're like, I expect the pastor to say that. Yeah, expect. No, no, no. This is what we're called to. Already, I was thinking, man, we've been singing all my life. You have been faithful. We've been proclaiming. He's our living hope. Because Monday morning, last week, I forgot that. And now I'm back with God's people. No wonder my week was off the rails. Because I forgot, or wow, I hadn't been here in a while, and today I was reminded again of how much he loves me. I was reminded, I love this church. I want to raise my children in the Lord. That's what we're doing. I mean, because here's what happens. What we see here is 
they get together. This is going to be the primary now the rest of this sermon. We get together. We don't do virtual life together. We do real life in real relationship. We actually get together. You've heard much. There's been so much written, so much talked about how we're the most connected generation ever in history, and yet the most disconnected. There's a couple of reasons for that. One is we have exchanged connection with a pseudo false connection, believing we'd be online or whatever else, or social media, and I'm connected with all these people. I got all these friends. And you're, you're, and you're laying on the couch at home. And, and, and instead, you, you, we, we've, we've exchanged that for personal, real relationships. And I think the other reason is, as believers, could it be that because Christ is, well, he's Lord of my life, and we're not passionately devoted to come together and proclaim him as Lord together. Because when we gather, friends, I'm telling you this morning, I was up praying, uh, then praying with our, our team. We gather early, and then at 8.30, we gather again. And I'm praying with a group down in the fellowship hall. You're invited to come and join us. And we pray, and I'm telling you, the Lord shows up, like he said, in ways that he does not when we're just kind of alone. He, I mean, we pray all the time. But we gather together, and I'm telling you, you start to sense the Spirit of God moving. And listen, worship should be a priority in life. So what do we do when we get together? Here it is. We get together to learn. That's the apostles' teaching. It's doing what we're doing right now. And, and, and you say, what was the content of the apostles' teaching? Um, Jesus. That, that was the content. Who he is, his life, his, his, how he lived, his crucifixion, and his resurrection. He was, you could say it this way, all of our teaching here in the church is Christocentric. And this is a challenge to all my teachers. I mean, the whole, all of it is the word of God, the full counsel of God, because it all points to Jesus in the end. But if we're not pointing people to Jesus, no wonder we kind of get off track, right? We get together, look at this next one, to share our common union in Christ. That's what the fellowship is, koinonia. I love you as Jesus loves me. We love each other, and here we find a common participation together in Jesus or in him. I mean, think about this. Uh, people, I was thinking about this this week. I, I'm looking out here, people that I know and love, people you know, cross-generational. Uh, I, 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 I could go to the other end of the building in particular. I see people that, that, that don't look like me, and, and uh, you know, they're in our in Espanol service. There's so many people in this church I would not know. There's no way I would know you if we weren't in church together. And it's a beautiful thing. People that aren't in a church like ours, and I love the fact that we're this diverse cross-generational church because we get to know each other and we get to know people from different walks of life. And the more involved you are in the church, the more that happens. And so they get together. There's common participation and fellowship, but this fellowship is not exclusive. If, you're, if your group is exclusive... It's not finding its source in the person of Jesus, who was a friend of sinners, who, who was reaching out to all people. You may, go, you may have a bi Christian group, Christian Bible study, but if it's not inclusive, it doesn't recalibrate back to the heart of Jesus. And so it's fellowship, but it's not we're just hiding out. We welcome others in. So look at this. We get, to, we get together to live, our li live out our lives. This is the breaking of bread. It's coming together. You see, the breaking of bread is probably not the Lord's Supper there, though that, that did happen often. We see in 1 Corinthians, it happened while they would be eating. And so the, 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 even the meals, they would talk about Jesus. They would worship. Uh, they, would, they would have communion and fellowship together. They'd probably talk about Jesus and infirm, encourage each other. Last week, um, Stacy and I, you know, we go out to meals and dinners with people. We're going, we got a dinner group coming up. Uh, our, our church, though it's large, we can get smaller in our connect groups and we can then have relationships with people. We had lunch last week with Han and Luna, who are new in our church. Uh, and if you go to Muchachos over here, um, which is really good, by the way. But, um, but if you go there, our entire church is there after, after church. <laughs> and it's awesome. I mean, no, it's fun. It's really fun. But we're there, and we're learning their stories. We're getting to know them and stories of great joy and how they came to Christ, how they met each other, and just a lot of laughter. I mean, that's what we do as a church. In fact, I'd encourage you right now, you invite somebody to go to lunch with you today. Somebody you don't know. That's what we do. Uh, and gathering for meals is a big deal. Not just a, you know, like a Baptist thing. You know, 
I mean, we eat a lot, but, but it's, it's a real thing. It's like we're obeying scripture. He knows what we're doing. It says nothing about fried chicken or, or whatever else, but breaking of bread, meals together. And then look at this. We get together to talk to the king. Then notice the, the article there, the prayers, certain prayers, specific prayers. We pray all the time. Start every meeting with prayer. We pray at 8 o'clock. There's a prayer gathering in the, in the Narthex Chapel. We pray at 8.30 in the Fellowship Hall. Our, our Hispanic friends pray like from 8 till um, like 10.45. I mean, they're just praying like nobody's business. We pray on Monday mornings um, in, at, from 10 to 12 in 103 Read. You can come to these meetings. We're going to pray tomorrow night before Deacon's meeting. We pray for people in need. If you ever want us to pray for you, you, you let us know. We're going to pray tomorrow at 6 o'clock. Come join us right here in the Great Hall. We, there's a Thursday morning, 6 a.m. prayer. There's a staff gathering. We pray on Thursday morning. And, and we pray constantly. You can put your prayer, prayer uh, request in the car, on the card there that you receive in the bulletin. Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. I heard this week uh, Paula and Keith Beasley had a gathering at their home to pray for, for Brooke, a gal who's been in our, our ministry here, a high school student who's going through a stem cell transplant the next day. So let's, let's pray. And we're seeing God move in mighty ways. Look at verse 40, 43. And all came upon every soul. I love it. See, every person is a soul, right? And, and, and many wonders and signs are being done by the apostles. When we pray, we see God move mightily. Look at verse 44. And all who believed were together, there's that word again, and had all things in common. So we see this sharing, which is rooted in the teaching and life of Jesus. Look at verse 45. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as anyone had need. They were, it's ongoing, continuous sharing. And sometimes we just give. Because stewardship is, hey, I don't own anything. God owns everything. I had a meeting with, uh, or it was a lunch gathering with, again, eating, with uh, Abraham Sarkar and his wife, Amy, and we're just talking about all that's happening in Bangladesh. He's in our church, Gospel for Muslims, an incredible ministry where we have microloans that are given to people, like 200,000 microloans have been given to folks who make $2 a day, where child trafficking is, is a major problem and thing because they, people don't have anything. These microloans are given a, a loan officer and this incredible organization that is allowing them to, to be empowered, to live their lives. And so look, look at verse 46. And day by day, attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. I'm going to land it here. Every day, it says, and it's emphatically in the front because it's pointing out, stresses the daily ongoing practice. The kingdom of God is not just coming to church. We know this. It's a way of life. And in the days to come, we're going to be talking about practicing the way of Jesus as we walk through the Easter season. In fact, I want to encourage you now, make plans to be here in this room, not this Wednesday night, but the next as we look at Ash Wednesday, kind of a portal into the Easter season. I hope you'll come. The people gathered and, and they, they said, man, the gathering of the saints, the gathering of the body is a priority for me. And I want to challenge you. Let it be that for you, friends. I love the picture we see here uh, of people who are glad and, and joyous, celebrative because of what Jesus had done for them. And look at what it says in verse 47. Praising God and having favor. Favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily, day by day, those who are being saved. Man. I mean, for Jesus, the person, the personality, the person of Jesus to take center stage. He's the head of the church. We talk about him. We worship him. We, we focus on him. We want to be like him. And with glad and sincere hearts, we come together and worship him. Who doesn't want to get in on that? And the Lord adds to our number daily as we go to be salt and light in the world. And so I'm going to close in prayer. If you'll just... Bow your head and close your eyes. I want to bring a, a real challenge to us now. And then we'll head out into the day. Do you know him? This king, Jesus. Jesus is king. He has a kingdom. And the kingdom has a people. 
be the kingdom people that he's called us to be. Have you received his grace? Don't leave today without settling that one. Let us talk to you. If you need to join the church, friends, do something. That's the point today. Kingdom people do things differently. They do things that align up with the life of Jesus and what he's called us to do. So if today you need to come and talk to someone, if you need prayer, we're here for you. If you want to come and be baptized, make that decision now. Proclaim him as as Lord. As you head into the week, look for opportunities to proclaim him as Lord of your life. A life filled with peace in the age of anxiety. A life filled with joy in a world with so much sadness and anger. Uh, Unity in a divided nation. Love in a world that needs it so desperately. Lord, we praise you. We commit ourselves anew to you now. Stop worshiping our kings, these little kings of, of pleasure and comfort. All the gods that we placed up before us, we renounce them and we proclaim your king. Your king. So, King Jesus, we give you our lives. Be Lord of our lives, we pray. In your name, amen.